And welcome once again to Bible study for Concord Baptist Church, Lexington, South Carolina, with Pastor Frank Townsend. Um, I pray that you might get a blessing from the message tonight. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. The gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for this day you gave us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the rain. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and long suffering and protecting us and watching over us throughout the day and bringing us home safely at night. And uh, Lord, with the family. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we read from that word, as we do a little study. And Lord, that you would take and use it for your honor and glory. Lord, we pray for those again that are sick, that are under the weather, that are out of the way. And Lord, we pray for Brother Roger tonight. Lord, I hear that he might be released tomorrow to come home. He still has a long way to go. But Lord, he's been in that hospital now a month. And so I pray that you would uh, help him, strengthen him, encourage him. And Lord, I pray for all my f family members, my loved ones, uh, Lord, here in, in the nether states. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for anything that's done that's good tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, girls, come sing a song. And then we'll play one by Miss Pam Lindsay. And uh, we'll go from there. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring of my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, for and there was multiplied to me. Lesson I learned, then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, then my burden so found liberty. Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. Salvation's plan, all oh, the grace that brought it down to man, all oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Yeah, Mercy that was great and grace was free, pardon that was multiplied to me. There, my burden and soul found liberty. Amen, girls. Thank you. All right. I'd like to play a song for you now from Miss Pam Lindsay. Miss Pam Lindsay is was a neighbor of ours when we moved here in 1978. And uh, through her husband, I uh, entered the relationship with Gethsemane Anabaptist Church and it got saved. Uh, I thought I was saved. I spent three years in the Southern Baptist Church and 
I thought that I was saved and uh, I had religious tendencies, religious feelings and all this, but found out when I heard the preaching of the word of God and learned some doctrine that I was still lost in my sin, that I had just turned over a new leaf. And uh, it's like one of the fellows at church and Sunday school said the other day, when you turn that leaf over, what's underneath it? <laughs> the same old stuff that was there before it just has a new name called religion. But anyway, I'm going to play this song by Miss Lindsay. Uh, she's still at Gethsemane Baptist church. They changed the name back to Baptist church. And uh, we found this old tape from years ago and that's what we're playing. So mercy flowing from the heart of God. Amen. Also singing with her was her husband, Brother Blake Lindsay. The ironic thing is when we moved here in 78, they lived, uh, well, the third house up and her mother lived right across the street. And since then they passed away and they had moved away. And when the mother passed away, they moved back in there. They're in the house across the street again. It's ironic how the Lord works that. Uh, all he wanted was a set of jumper cables and to borrow a set of jumper cables. And through that, the Lord uh, eventually let me hear the preaching of the word of God, according to the scripture. And I got saved. All right. I was smiling here. I saw my sister, Kathy. She's a uh, said, hello, everyone smiles. And, uh, and my sister, Ruth, want to know how it's going down here. Well, how's it going up there? You still got any of that snow up there yet? Uh, earlier in the week, well, you're lucky. <laughs> uh, you might not think so, but we don't get to see much snow down here. All right. Uh, we're going to get into uh, Dr. M. R. DeHaan's book, uh, The Chemistry of the Blood and Chemistry of Calvary. And uh, we left off where we're getting into the knowledge that Moses had. We'll be starting that in a moment. But first, I wanted to share something else with you. If you have your pencils and paper, or, or if you don't, I wish you'd get them, because I'm going to give you three or four verses that you can be studying. So when we get into the pre-Adamic earth, you can be reading and be a little more familiar with it if you're going to be following. But uh, in Genesis, in chapter 7, I, I jumped over that last night. And uh, in verse 11, 
It says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Did you catch that? The great deep. Job 38, 30 says uh, the face of the deep is frozen now. This is that body of water called the great deep. And uh, he opened the windows of heaven. Amen. He broke up or he broke up the, all the fountains of the great deep. They were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So that's where the water rushed in from the top, gushed in from the bottom and over flooded the whole earth to the top of the highest mountain. And then you read in chapter eight where they were abated and they withdrew. So that's uh, one verse that I wanted to share with you. Another one is over in second Peter, second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, beginning in verse five, Peter said this, for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now your new fake news Bibles and sometime your study Bibles in the center reference will make that Noah's flood. That is not Noah's flood. That was pre-Adamic. That was when Lucifer tried to overthrow God and uh, God turned the world upside down and he sunk it. At that time, it was sitting in the water, as you can see here. It was standing out of the water and in the water. Just picture a cork. If you've ever been fishing, you throw your line out and the cork sitting there, it's in the water or on the water, amen, and uh, it's out of the water. It's in and out at the same time. And that's the way the, worth, the world once sat before Adam. You know, Peter had to bring this up, and one of the men in the church, I was talking to him on the phone this evening, one of the men in the church said this. He said, Preacher, you realize that even back then, they were still trying to convince the religious crowd, the Pharisees and all, about where the earth was. Now, if you look over in Psalm 24, Psalm 24, and we're going to look in uh, verse one, it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now there's an Old Testament reference to what Peter was saying in 2 Peter 3, 5. If you look in the book of Job in chapter 26, you'll find that the earth is not in the water and out of the water in that verse, that there it's hanging upon nothing. And that's what science tells us today, amen? So there's two different locations here of where the earth was. One was pre-Adamic, amen. The other one was Adamic, amen. Now, in Psalm 48, the Bible says, great is the Lord, verse one, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Now he says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king, said God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it and so they marveled. They were troubled and they hasted away. Fear took hold upon them there and pain as of a woman in travail. Now, why were they in fear? because they were seeing something. Here's the earth sitting at the feet of the throne of Almighty God in the water and out of the water. You say, preacher, how can you say that? Well, turn over, if you would, to Isaiah in chapter 66 in verse one. Thus saith the Lord, 
The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? So he says that heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. So the kings of the earth, as they passed by, they looked up, they saw, and they were troubled because here's Lucifer fixing to rebel on a holy, almighty, all-powerful God. Now, the Bible tells us in Timothy to study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Over in the Old Testament, we're told that we're to take line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's how we study. And we we go back to one section and we see where it takes us. And, and the key to the Bible, the key to studying it is believing it. You may not understand it. And not everybody understands all of it but take it for what it says. Believe what it says, whether it makes any sense to you or not at the time that you're reading it. And as I said the other night, the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. All right? Ask God for wisdom. Prayerfully read your Bible. Go through it. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And again, as Paul told Timothy, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. For instance, I'll give you this. In the Gospels, it speaks of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. These are two separate kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven had ordinances of divine worship. That's where the Israel had to do certain sacrifices. They had partake of certain things. That's who Jesus came unto, and that's who they rejected. And so he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. In uh, the book of John, he says that except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is within you. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Kingdom of heaven was sacrifices and drink offerings and those such things. But the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it's within you. So that's just some of the things that you have to look at when you're rightly dividing the scripture, because you could take something that the Lord was dealing with Israel about in the tribulation period in Matthew 24, where they have to endure unto the end. And then when you get over to Hebrews, where he was dealing with people that could lose their salvation, amen. And it says that if they did lose it, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance, seeing that they crucified to themselves, amen, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and do, uh, I'm looking for the word, I just drew a blank. Anyway, they do despite unto the spirit of grace. And when you look at that, you say, well, you mean I can lose my salvation? You mean I have to endure to the end? No, he was dealing with Israel, and they had embraced John's gospel, Remember John, the one that, uh, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the, the guy with the locust and the honey, you know? Yeah, him. And uh, the one that lost his head over a dance <laughs> when he told uh, the king that it wasn't lawful to have his brother's Philip's wife. You know, here's a man of God that stood on the truth and they took his head off. But uh, they were under that gospel. And while they were under that, they embraced Jesus Christ, they tasted of the Holy Ghost, but then they said, hey, this isn't, this doesn't seem right. Uh, it, it's not as, uh, I don't know, it, it, it doesn't seem to mean as much as it did when we did all these other things, you know, we did a lot of work back there. And uh, so if they took and slaughtered a lamb after that 
and offered it up at the temple and the altar, then they were doing despite unto the spirit of grace. They were trodden underfoot the blood of the covenant of the son of God. And they went back to an animal sacrifice and they lost it and couldn't get it back. And that's what the book of Hebrews was dealing with over there. And an example of that is in the book of Acts when Paul was uh, taking a vow and he had shaved his head. And on the seventh day, they were about to offer up the sacrifice and God caused a riot and Paul had to be let down. Uh, and he got away from there and never got to offer that sacrifice. And right after that is when the Lord sent Titus through to destroy the temple and he destroyed it. So now therefore a messianic Jew, when he trusts, trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, he's just like any other Gentile. He's sealed into the day of redemption by that Holy spirit of promise. Now I know a lot of this is over a lot of your heads, but maybe down the road, we'll get into it and get, take it verse by verse. But anyway, when, when that temple was destroyed, they had no place to offer that sacrifice. Now I met a, a Jewish pilot. I used to keep my plane in Winsboro, South Carolina. And uh, I flew in there one evening and, and uh, this Jewish fellow was there and he was a pilot and we got to talking and he said, you Christians hate us. I said, no, the Christians don't hate you. Somebody truly born again loves the Jew because God loves the Jew. And uh, I got to witness to him. And I asked him, I said, where do you offer your blood? And what do you use for blood? He says, we'll use chicken blood symbolically. All right. But they have no temple to offer it in. So they're still in their sin if that's what they're trusting. And that's why they need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ also. I'm taking up all my time on that tonight. Uh, didn't mean to, but uh, I, that's just some things that in the word of God, and you'd have to study and pick it out. And, and uh, man, it's just so amazing. Some things are stranger to fiction and they're real. This isn't a game. This is real stuff. And, you know, I'm thinking about this coronavirus and all this stuff where they're trying to, you know, now they want to put up drones where they can take your temperature over the cities and they, they want to set up uh these programs and apps to where they can track you and everything. Uh, if you've read the Bible any, you know that what we're setting up for is a one world government, the Antichrist. And that means that the church is getting ready to check out because the church has to go out before the Antichrist can take over. And that's pretty close. So if you're not saved, you might want to, get in the word of God and pray and ask God to help you. And if you've got lost loved ones that aren't saved, you better quit worrying about hurting their feelings and talk to them about the Lord and try to bring them to Christ before it's too late. Uh, gee, I've got this far now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I want to go here with this. Uh, the next part that we were going to get into on the blood and the uh, on the uh, chemistry, Moses' knowledge of chemistry, as I was looking over it, I realized that how did no, Moses know how to grind gold so fine that he turned it into a powder? How did he know these things? Well, I remember that I read that Moses was down in Egypt and raised by Pharaoh's daughter for 40 years. And everybody knows that the Egyptians knew some things about chemistry and science that the rest of the world hadn't had at that time, like embalming and different things. My mummy told me so. And <laughs> just joking. And uh, so he had some wisdom from the world, but also I believe that God helped him. I'm just going to read you three things here because we're almost out of our time again. And we'll pick back up on this again tomorrow night. It says Moses' knowledge of chemistry. And, and by the way, not everything in this book 
is 100% scripturally correct. You know, last night we said, we read that uh, Mr. DeHaan said that the Ark of the Covenant was an oblong box. Well, actually it was a uh, rectangular box and it had a lot to do with God sitting there and judging Israel uh, in their sin and the sacrifice that offered upon it. But I'm not worried about that right now. I'm just trying to read through this stuff so that we can get, I guess you'd say, the meat of it. So here it is. It says, it is very evident from this record that Moses had a supernaturally given knowledge of the science of chemistry. You may have wondered why Moses took the calf and submitted it to the melting, pounding, grinding, and suspension. The result was a suspension which became a vivid type of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chemistry, we speak of three kinds of mixtures. They are as follows. Number one, a mechanical mixture. If I drop a piece of metallic gold in water, no solution occurs. The gold is intact and remains in the water. Pure gold is, in, is insoluble in water. Number two, a suspension of emulsion. Finally, divided particles of a metallic substance may, by the addition of another chemical, be suspended in water. There is no solution. The finely ground particles are merely suspended in the water. There is no solution. We call this emulsion. And then number three, a chemical solution. If I take a teaspoon of sugar, put it into a glass of water, the sugar will not mix or be suspended, but will, eat, will enter into a solution so that the results will be an increase in weight, but not an increase in volume. The sugar dissolves and the atoms take up their place in the interatomic spaces in the water. This is solution. Gold is insoluble in water, being 19 times heavier with specific gravity of 19.5. In fine powder, it assumes the collodial condition and added to water results in the coloration that appears to be solution. As the particles are made finer, the bulk is greatly increased and acquires an apparent specific gravity, permitting its suspension in water, giving the liquid a deep red color. Scientific records state that collodial gold in water is a rose red color when the particles are of 10 microns size in, in a dilution of one to 100,000. 10 micro, microns equal 0 0.0003937 or 0 0.4 thousands inches. From this, you will see that gold in dust size will color water as blood, which means that this calf of gold need not to have been very large to color sufficient water blood red to furnish drinks to at least two or more million people. Collodial gold can be made in many ways, but the method of Moses is the best under the circumstances in the wilderness. The burning removed the impurities. The stamping or beating reduced it to thin sheets because of the ductibility of gold. Gold leaf can be made so thin that it requires about 280,000 of them to make one inch. Sheets as thin as 0.0.0. 0004 millionth of an inch have been made. Then the grinding becomes easy and further information proves that Moses ground it very fine, as fine as dust, reducing it to the size of collodial gold. This cast into the brook would make the water blood red. It was non-toxic, impurities having been burned out and was inhibitory to germ life. The resultant waters would be blood red and possesses purifying qualities. All of this was a fitting type of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought that was very interesting. And uh, we'll pick up on the rest of that tomorrow evening, Lord willing. But I, I wanted to get those other verses out to you tonight so that you could begin your own study. Look at those verses. Matter of fact, I'd like to read you one more verse in Jeremiah in chapter four, Jeremiah in chapter four. 
in verse 23. Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. Now, where did you hear those words before? You reckon that might've been in Genesis 1-1 last night? I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. And he didn't because he came back in Genesis 1-2. And this is where they call it the gap theory. We say the gap is between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Which beginning? There's many beginnings in the Bible, but they mean in the beginning when God first created the earth and I'm sure it was daytime. And then they say the earth was without form and void. Why? Because it had been destroyed, Jeremiah chapter four. And people call that the gap theory. And I'd just like to say this, the only gap is between your ears, amen? That's where the gap is because they will not believe this Bible. I've had preachers that preach for me or have stood up and uh, one at a camp meeting at the campground one time when I was a young man and he got up and he held this Bible up. He says, I believe that this is the word of God and there's not one error in it. A little bit later, he gets up there and he says, now uh, this word here where it says devils into the swine, that should be demons. Does it sound like he thinks there's a mistake in it? Yes, he did. So I stayed quiet till after the services. And I went up afterwards. Bible says not to rebuke an elder, but entreat him as a father. And he was an elder at the time. And I went up to him and I said, Brother uh, McBee, McAbee, I said, uh, you uh, stood up on that pew. And you shook this Bible and you said that you didn't believe there was one error in it. Yeah, yeah, that's right, son. That's right. I said, uh, and then it wasn't five minutes later, sir. You said that this this here uh, shouldn't be devils. It ought to be demons. Well, see, there's no demons in the King James Bible. They're all devils. And he got all upset and frustrated. Wah, 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 wah. There's only one devil. I said, that's not what it says, brother. I said, it says they're devils the devil and his devils. And man, he just got all flustered and aggravated. And so I saw where it was going and I, I just walked away. So when these people say that they believe that this King James Bible is the infallible and errant word of God, what most of them mean is in the original language, in the Hebrew and the Greek, they're not talking about the book in their hand. They're not talking about that. And see, those aren't Bible believers. Those are Bible correctors. And see, if that's the case, then you need them to help you know what this Bible says. And God told us to keep his commandments. So don't you think that we ought to be able to know what it says on our own in prayer and with God? Well, of course. So be careful when you when these people say they believe the King James Bible is the word of God and they didn't want to correct it with the Hebrew and the Greek. Uh, my pastor knew a, Greek man that I think he used to fly with and his mother lived in Greece and she knew the old language. And she said that the language had deteriorated. Now you look at our language today, it's deteriorated in the English language. I mean, if I was to tell you tonight that I'm gay, what would you think? Well, I'm not that gay. Amen. It, it used to mean that I was happy. Our language has deteriorated and so has the Greek language. And beside that, nobody has a complete copy of the Hebrew and the Greek. And if they did, they couldn't read it. So what they do is they go back 
in the back of a Strong's Concordance, and it's got a Hebrew and a Greek dictionary, and they look at the numbers that's given to them under the word that they looked up in the Strong's Concordance. Then they go back to the back of the concordance where the Hebrew and the Greek dictionary is, and they look up that number, and then they try to say that word. That's the only Hebrew and Greek they know. Amen. Trust your Bible. You know what? I don't care if you've got a sixth grade education. You believe this Bible. You're smarter than anybody that's been to, we call it cemetery. They call it seminary and have been corrupted out of the word of God. Believe your Bible. So when you read it, the first thing you need to do is say, this is right. Everybody else is wrong. And Lord, I don't understand it right now, but I pray that you would give me the understanding here as we fellowship, Lord. And I'm going to tell you what, you'll have some great times with the Lord if you ever get to that point. Well, that's all for tonight. God bless you all. Appreciate everybody that tuned in. And uh, we'll go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And I hope you'll be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Grace, Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, I pray that anything that was said, Lord, was pleasing to you. And Lord, it was to your honor and glory. And I pray that it helps the folks that are watching and listening. Lord, to, to learn to study their Bible. And Lord, they don't have to have a college education. Lord, you know that. John the Baptist didn't have a college education. Uh, well, they say he went to Wilderness U. So he went to the University of Wilderness, and he came out there and said more truth and stood on the word of God, even to the point that it took his head because they believed this book and they believed you. And the same with Peter and James and John and the other apostles, Lord, that were crucified themselves. And Peter wanted to be crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified like you. And John on the island of Patmos before he went there was boiled in Nevada oil. And Lord, he came through just like Daniel in the lion's den or the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Lord, all the way through here, there's people that stood on your word. Some have died and they've gone on to be martyrs. And they've got a martyr's crown and they'll have a reward. Uh, I remember reading in Fox's Book of Martyrs of one of one martyr. Uh, they were going to burn him at a stake. And his friend said, if it's tolerable, give us give us a sign. And they said, while his flesh was melting off of him, he said, it's tolerable. It's tolerable. And so, Lord, help us. Lord, we've not suffered nothing like the saints of old. And I thank you for that. But I pray that you'd give us courage, and wisdom, Lord, to fellowship with you and to proclaim your gospel in these last days to our lost loved ones, to our friends, to our relatives, to our children, our grandchildren. Lord, that when you sound the trumpet and we're caught up in the air to meet you or whether we go by grave, Lord, we'll see each other again. Father, thank you once again for all you do for us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and ask these things. Amen. All right. Thank you for tuning in there, sisters. I hope you have a good evening. Good night.